He said in 1520, be assured that no one will make a doctor of the Holy Scriptures save only the Holy Ghost from heaven. Luther was a great lover of the Holy Spirit. His exaltation of the book as an external word did not belittle the Spirit. On the contrary, he would say, it elevated the Spirit's great gift to Christendom. 1533, he said, the Word of God is the greatest, most necessary, most important thing in Christendom. Without the external word, we would not know one spirit from the other, he said. And the objective personality of the Holy Spirit himself would be lost in a blur of subjective expressions. Cherishing the book implied to Martin Luther that the Holy Spirit is a beautiful person to be known and worshipped not a buzz to be felt. And you would never know him apart from the book. For the Spirit's sake, we exalt the book. The second objection he knew would come is that, this is a little more modern, though both are very modern, to the degree that you exalt this, people will say, you minimize the incarnate word. Jesus Christ himself, born of a virgin, crucified, risen, reigning, when you exalt a book. Luther says that the opposite is true. To the degree that the word of God is disconnected from the objective external Word, this book, to that degree, the incarnate word becomes a wax nose in the preference of every generation. You do not honor or exalt the incarnate word, the historical Jesus, by in any way minimizing the external word. Luther said that the one weapon with which he could rescue the incarnate word from being sold in the markets of Wittenberg was the external word. He drove out the money changers, the indulgent sellers, with one whip, the word, the external word. So Christ, the historical Jesus, is magnified and glorified and preserved in his excellency precisely through saying that the Word of God is preserved for us one way in a book. It's an amazing observation. The implications of it are simply stunning. They are world-shaking. So for the sake of the Holy Spirit and His beautiful personhood and the relationship we can enjoy with Him in dynamic fellowship and for the sake of the glory of Jesus Christ who is not anybody's wax nose, we and Luther exalt the book. The book. He said, the apostles themselves considered it necessary to put the New Testament into Greek and to bind it fast to that language, doubtless in order to preserve it for us safe and sound as in a sacred ark. The implications of this truth that he rediscovered for the pastoral ministry are immense. We pastors are essentially brokers of the word of God transmitted in a book. We are brokers of the living word of God preserved and transmitted for us in a book. We are fundamentally readers. Teachers, proclaimers of a message in a book. And all of this is for the glory of the incarnate word and for the indwelling Holy Spirit. But neither the word incarnate nor the indwelling spirit leads us away from the book, which Luther called the external 
word. Christ himself, now mark this, Christ himself, the living, risen Lord, stands forth for worship, stands forth for fellowship, and stands forth for obedience in our lives today from the book. That's where he stands forth. And Luther would say preaching is simply the contemporary release of that fixed external, external word into the lives of people for the fellowship of the living Christ. The Spirit of God broods over this book because the book is the only place where Christ is clear. And the Spirit loves clear pictures of Jesus. The Spirit is in the business of glorifying a finely contoured Christ, not a fuzzy, hazy, mushy Christ. And therefore he broods over the pages of the book. If you want to walk into the presence of the Spirit in preparation for your message, you put your elbows on either side of the book. And you'll be in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, the question I want to ask this morning, afternoon, is what difference did this discovery make in the way he carried on the ministry of the Word? And I want to learn with you from Luther how to study in view of this great Reformation discovery. He was a university professor all of his life. And therefore, the problem arises in this room that we would tend to say he doesn't know what we deal with. He's not a pastor. So your elevating of him as kind of a model for study is totally irrelevant because we, we're not university professors. And I want to answer that objection by just walking with you toward his professorship first, historically, so you can get a feel for his life, and then giving three reasons why he should be listened to in this regard. Born November 10, 1483, in Eisleben to a copper miner who wanted him so badly to be a lawyer. And he was on his way to being a lawyer. Uh, Heiko Obermann, you'll hear that name frequently because uh, the two biographies I, I have used are uh, Here I Stand, Roland Bainton, and Heiko Obermann, Luther, but, uh, Man Between God and the Devil. That's all. I didn't read any other biographies. I looked in other biographies and look, used their indexes, but I didn't read them straight through. So you're ahead of me if you've read more than two biographies of Luther. His father, uh, Heiko Obermann, said we know almost zero from substantiated evidence of his first 18 years. 1502, at the age of 19, he receives a bachelor's degree, University of Erfurt, 30th in his class out of 57. Probably owing to the fact that his uh, early education was lousy, Obermann surmised. January 1505, he receives his Master of Arts, same university. Um... He, I'm missing a page here, where it is, there it is, thank you, um, was on his way home from law school, as you know, July 2nd, 1505, when a thunderstorm broke out and uh, he was knocked literally off of his horse by lightning. And he was so frightened that he cried out, help me, Saint Anne, I will become a monk. In other words, uh, since he did not know the safety of the gospel, he took the next best thing, which was the safety of the monastery. And his, uh, to his father's utter dismay, he kept his vow two weeks later and went to the monastery there and asked to be accepted, which